Illegal raves are widely advertised online if you know where to look. And as of this weekend, they've become even more illegal because the law has just changed so that organizers can now be fined 10,000 pounds and you can be fined 100 pounds on the spot just for attending. So a couple of days ago, I bought a ticket online. It cost me just 20 pounds. It was very easy to do. They promised me that they would send me the location, which was a secret location for the rave. They said they would text it to me on the day. So I've just had a WhatsApp through telling me that the rave is at a truck stop somewhere off the M25. It's currently ongoing at the moment. It's going on until the small hours of this morning. So let's go to an illegal COVID rave. Bill's Cat and Coke, yeah. That's what I've got, yeah. Say again? Bill's Cat and Coke, yeah. Bill's Cat and Coke. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've got a couple of friends arriving in a bit, so I'll come and look you up. Yeah. What is, how much is it for everything? Grab, grab for 90 pound of coke. 90 quid of coke. Yeah. Is it good stuff? Yeah. You can try it first if you want it, bro. Do you know what I mean? I'm, there you go. I'm not going nowhere. I'm here. I'll catch you later, yeah, brother. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. Peace. So I've been here for just over an hour. There are perhaps 200 people here. None of them are social distancing. None of them are wearing face masks. There are a lot of drugs being taken. The music is loud. And this is a rave in direct breach of the government's guidelines and indeed the law. But the people here don't particularly seem to care all that much. Well, yeah, but so you're not worried about getting it? No, no, of course not. Why would I be worried? It's just like getting a flu. Yeah. It's a 98% survival rate. Why would yeah. I be worried? Oh, really? Are you worried about getting fined, though? I don't care. They could, what are they going to do? Fine us, apparently. Fine us. They're not going to fine me. I didn't bring my, my ID. So if they arrest me, I'll just be like, no comment. Apparently, police have just walked up. What? Really? The police have just come? No. Where are they? Apparently, they're here, yeah. Wow. The police have just arrived, four of them. And the organizers told us all to social distance, to spread out, to put masks on. And the police hovered around for maybe 10 minutes and they seemingly have now left. So perhaps they'll be back to shut this illegal party down, perhaps they won't. But it would be very strange if the police had come to a rave which is clearly in breach of numerous coronavirus guidelines and then suddenly left. We're basically just going to check out the bikes and stuff, alright? As you can see behind me, the police have stopped a young black man. Are you, you going to give me the bills? And then I can put it through back in so you can stop. We're out on patrol with the Violence Suppression Unit in Islington and Camden. It's part of a new structure input across London in May to deal with some of the capital's most violent and serious crime. It's also one of the units most likely to use a range of tactics, including the controversial stop and search. We're off what sounds like a potential sighting of a suspect in a mugging that's just happened. We switched on the blue lights when I was speeding around. North London in hot pursuit. As you can see behind me, the police have stopped a young black man. Now, it's just after a robbery, a mugging was reported over the radio minutes ago. This young man matches the description of the robber. He's got a bike. Police have stopped him. They've handcuffed him whilst they check whether the bike is his, whether he has anything on him that he shouldn't have. The exchange is polite so far. The young man is cooperating. It's possible that he was just here minding his own business. But the point is, this isn't a random stop. This is uh, based on intelligence from a robbery that was reported just moments ago down the road from here. And it's a delicate balance for police to strike between catching the people who do the wrong things and not stopping innocent people in the street who are simply minding their own business. This is the police team that's just dealt with the victim of the robbery. And what's just happened is they've arrived on scene to see whether the bike that our police officers have seized matches the description and they've just confirmed that it doesn't uh, so now it looks as though uh, this young man is going to be allowed to go on his way um, having it has to be said just been handcuffed and searched but the police said with good reason they've now established that there's no reason to suspect him and he'll be able to get on with his life as you can see we were very polite we were having a laugh and joke with him towards the end he seemed like a, a nice guy actually can and you I was... explain the handcuffs a lot of people find it oppressive, but really it's for officer safety. It's better with our sort of my experiences to handcuff someone early rather than search and suddenly find there's, they've got a knife in them. That the police disproportionately stop young black men is not in dispute. The stats are clear. But does that mean the police are racist? What if there are other factors at play? 
And this is an anecdotal trip. We've only been here a few hours, but every single one of these robberies has yeah. said the words IC3, which is black. This is not, of course, because black people are any more criminal, but they are more likely to be poor, to live in deprived areas, and deprivation correlates with violent crime, evidence of racism perhaps, but of a structural kind, rather than the kind that wears a badge. But however you rationalise it, the facts are clear. Stop and search disproportionately affects black communities. That has a corrosive effect on trust and their sense that they can ever be policed fairly. The world's media have descended here on St Thomas's Hospital in central London, where in the building behind me, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is in an intensive care unit suffering from COVID-19. He was brought here at around 7 o'clock this evening after his condition suddenly worsened. But we understand that he is conscious and he's not yet been put on a ventilator, but make no mistake about it, he's in a very serious condition indeed. The first reaction must be a human one. Boris Johnson is, after all, a father, a son, a brother, a partner. But he is also the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. We're told that Dominic Raab, the Foreign Secretary, will deputise for him where necessary. But only this afternoon, Number 10 was still insisting that Boris Johnson was in charge. Things here are changing, and they're changing quickly. Protests have now left Hyde Park and hundreds of people are now streaming south towards Hyde Park Corner and then potentially in the direction of Parliament. As you can see behind me, the protests largely peaceful, although clearly angry. Two names on their lips, the names of George Floyd, the American man who was killed in police custody in Minnesota, and also of Belly Majinga, a transport worker here in London who died of coronavirus after being coughed at by a member of the public and no further action is being taken. The protesters here feel that is a miscarriage of justice. But all the while, it has to be said, very little social distancing going on. It's an incident that's as unusual as it is tragic. In the early hours of this morning, a police officer was shot dead inside the grounds of the Croydon Police Custody Centre, which you can see behind me. A 23-year-old man is in a critical condition in hospital, having suffered gunshot wounds, but he's also been arrested on suspicion of murder. It's understood that after the officer was shot, the suspect then turned the gun on himself. And it's precisely that that makes this incident so unusual. How did a loaded weapon get inside what is supposed to be a secure police custody centre? And it's that question that will form the basis and the key focus of the police investigation.